Welcome. It's good to have you join for the midweek Bible study of Akudun and Crossgar Presbyterian Churches. And just to say that we continue our studies on the Beatitudes. We've already studied six of these tonight. The seventh, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And the intention is to conclude the study of the Beatitudes next week. We have been online with our midweek Bible studies right from the 18th of March. And we're going to take a short break and return, God willing, and later in September. And of course, we will have to see, but potentially we'll be able to meet again in the church buildings. But thank you for those who've availed of the Bible studies and studied along with us. First, the life of Alicia back a few months ago, and now the Beatitudes. And for our own members in Akudui and Crossgar, a reminder that church services continue to be provided online on Sundays at 11.15. Of course, you can tune in anytime during the week as well. And then every Wednesday evening, right from March, in addition to the Bible study being available, we have met via Zoom for Bible study and prayer. And that will continue. And if you're in uh, that Zoom group, you'll be aware uh, of how it works. But any member that has not been in that but would like to join over the next number of weeks, uh, then please let me know and I will inform you of the link and what's involved. But it's good to meet together and to be able to pray for the needs of the church, uh, of the congregation, and of course for our world at this time. Well, today I want to read uh, from. Paul's letter to 2 Corinthians, we're going to be thinking about the peacemaker. And just to read again the beatitude that we will be studying, it's Matthew 5 and verse 9. It says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Some versions say they will be called children of God. But here it says, sons of God. The version that I am reading. If you want to turn with me, I'm going to read some verses from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And here Paul will speak about reconciliation. Reconciliation between God and sinners. And then the ministry of reconciliation that he has given to those who know Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm beginning to read at verse 16. From verse 16 to verse 21. This is God's word. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God has reconciled the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. We thank God for his truth. Let's bow in prayer before we study God's word together. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for these lovely words that we've read from the Apostle Paul, reminding us that those who are in Christ are new creations. The old is gone and new has come. We thank you that you're able to radically change us, to change us on the inside, to make us new creations, to give to us new desires, new goals, new ambitions. And Lord, we thank you most of all for your Son, the Lord Jesus, who died in our place, who became sin for us, that we might be reconciled to you, a holy God. And Lord, we are reminded that you have given to us this ministry of reconciliation. We are to point others to Christ, the one who is able to reconcile sinners to you, a perfect, holy and righteous God. So Lord, we rejoice in the reconciliation that Christ has achieved for us 
We thank that through his shed blood he has accomplished peace with God for all who repent. And we pray, Lord, that as we study this beatitude this evening, that you'll remind us of what Christ has done for us and encourage us to seek to be ambassadors for Christ and to be peacemakers in a troubled world. Lord, we commit our time to you and we pray that you would lead us and guide us by your Holy Spirit. And may Jesus in all things be honoured and glorified. We pray this in the precious, lovely name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. The world today is desperately seeking peace. And yet the truth is, peace seems more elusive than ever in 2020. Look at your news bulletins. What do we see? Wars, demonstrations, protests, marches, so much unrest, so much conflict. Indeed, disagreements and conflict are the order of the day in 2020. And the reason is simple. Sin in the hearts of men. You may ask the question, why has every human effort at lasting international peace failed? What's the problem? Well, there is one answer only that is adequate. You see, it's not a political solution that is the answer, not a social or economic solution. The answer is essentially and primarily our moral theological solution. What does James say about fights and quarrels? James chapter 4 verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You see, the trouble, the Bible tells us, is very simple. It is the heart of man. And until the heart of mankind individually and corporately is changed, then you will never solve the problem by trying to manipulate his circumstances. Tonight we've arrived at the seventh beatitude, the seventh statement of Jesus about the ethics of Christ's kingdom. The blueprint for how Christians are to behave to know God's approval and God's blessing. And it speaks about the issue of peace and peacemaking. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. You know, this is actually a favourite text of many who have no interest at all in Christianity. It's often quoted by secular pacifists. However, they fail to appreciate that real peace can only come about with a radical change in the human heart. And it's only God who can accomplish this. But as we consider this beatitude, I want you to notice four things. We want to think, first of all, about the meaning of being a peacemaker. The meaning of being a peacemaker. Jesus says, blessed or approved by God are the peacemakers. But what is a peacemaker? Well, the non-Christians, when sectors use this verse, and they like to quote it often, they don't really grasp what Jesus is speaking about. They think of peace in very, very narrow terms, simply the absence of war, the absence of conflict. However, the biblical concept of peace, both from the Greek and Hebrew word, is much more than the absence of conflict. It's much more than simply the absence of conflict. Peace in the Bible is a broad term. It relates to health, prosperity, harmony and wholeness. And when you use the Hebrew word shalom, you're not wishing someone merely the absence of war, but you're wishing them the full presence of peace and prosperity. You're wishing them all the blessings of God. Think about the famous ironic benediction from Numbers chapter 6 verses 24 and 25. And as Presbyterians, we often hear this pronounced at baptism. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace. Peace is not the absence of war. It's not the absence of conflict that brings peace. It is the presence of God in our hearts. But then secondly, the peace that Jesus is speaking about here, not only is it more than simply the absence of conflict, 
but it is not achieved by compromising. It's not achieved by compromise. He's not saying here, blessed are those who simply live and not live. Blessed are those who are tolerant of everything in society and say, well, as long as it doesn't harm me and my family, as long as I can get along with my own life, well, that's all right with me. That's not what this verse means. The believer is not asked to seek peace at any cost. Being a peacemaker does not mean being easygoing either, nor does it mean we appease all things, we accept all things and appease what society wants simply to avoid conflict. What does Jesus say? Happy, approved or blessed by God are the peacemakers. It's not blessed are the peaceful or blessed are the undisturbed. You see, we're not following kingdom ethics if we choose to disregard sin and evil in society. If we compromise simply because we want no problem, no animosity. See, compromise is not peace. So it's not simply the absence of conflict. It's not achieved by compromise. What then is a peacemaker? Well, listen to John MacArthur. This is what he says. The peace of which Christ speaks about in this beatitude and about which the whole of Scripture speaks is unlike that which the world knows and strives for. It is inner personal peace that he only can give to the soul of man and which only his children can exemplify. In other words, God is the source of peace, God alone. Someone has said this, a working definition of a peacemaker is this, someone who is actively seeking to reconcile people to God and to one another. Someone who is actually actively seeking to reconcile people to God and to one another. And you see, the true nature of peace that Jesus is talking about is not simply absence of conflict, it is reconciliation, reconciliation with God. And then after that, reconciliation with one another. Secondly, I want you to note the true model of a peacemaker. The true model of a peacemaker. And the supreme peacemaker is Jesus. Now in each of these beatitudes that have been advocated by the Saviour, our Lord himself is the perfect model when it comes to purity and being merciful. And here again, Jesus is the supreme peacemaker. You see, peacemaking is a divine work. And God is the God of peace. He's the author of peace. Jesus is the supreme peacemaker. He came to establish peace. His message explained peace. His death purchased peace. And his resurrected presence enables peace in our hearts. Remember back in Isaiah chapter 9, the messianic prediction, what did it say? He would be the prince of peace. Think about the angels as they announced the birth of Jesus on the hillside to shepherds. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to people on whom his favour rests. And what was his persistent word of absolution to sinners? Go in peace. Before he was crucified, he spoke to his disciples in the upper room. And this is what he said. Peace I with you. My peace I give unto you. I do not give as the world gives. Let not your heart be troubled. You see, Jesus is the supreme peacemaker. When he returned after his resurrection, his first word to his disciples was shalom, peace to you. Luke 24, verse 36. But you know, Jesus paid an enormous price to offer us peace with God. What does it say in Colossians 1, 19 to 20? For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to him all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Jesus purchased our salvation. He made peace and reconciliation possible with God because he died for us on the cross. The wrath of God was poured upon our Saviour. But as we turn to the book of Ephesians, as Paul writes there in chapter 2, he speaks also about the work of Christ bringing peace to all from all backgrounds. Ephesians 2, 14 and 15. For he himself is our peace, Paul says, 
who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two so making peace paul here is speaking about jesus dying for both jew and gentile becoming a peace offering and therefore reconciling both to god both jew and gentile to god and to one another and the cross is a place of reconciliation to god the place of reconciliation to one another and the lord not only reconciled jew and gentile but paul says here in ephesians 2 that he incorporated them into one new man which is the church of christ jesus reconciled jew and gentile tension by creating the church and our position in christ is in the church universal and that's where the believer finds his or her true identity. We do not find our identity in race, in place or in face. We find our identity in Christ. Our identity with Christ is the only source of peace that brings God together with men and men with one another. Jesus, the true peacemaker, the true model for us. Thirdly, I want to point to the method of peacemaking. You see, we can easily appreciate what the Bible teaches about Christ providing peace for us through his death on the cross. But we had asked, how are we to fulfill this role of being a peacemaker? How are we going to reconcile people to God? How are we to engage in this task? Well, a few things to say. First of all, we need to acknowledge the barriers to peacemaking. One of the greatest lessons for us to learn to becoming peacemakers is to learn to hold our tongues, to control our tongues. James, the New Testament book of wisdom says this, be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. And one writer commenting on that makes this statement, too often we let our mouth go running off before our mind is in gear. We must learn to control what we say not only do we need to keep ourselves from slander, gossip and repeating hurtful things unnecessarily, but we also have to be watchful for being both cutting and defensive in our own remarks. And he adds, nothing disqualifies us in being peacemakers more than talking about people rather than talking to them. A barrier to peacemaking, using our tongue in a wrong manner. Another barrier is simply self-focus. Martin Lloyd Jones warns that we should always view a situation in light of the gospel and not think personally about matters. He says when we think personally about things rather than making peace, we make war because we're so self-focused. We only see things from our own narrow perspective. And then we also Need to be aware of what Paul says. He says we should get rid of all strife and bitterness. There's no place for strife and bitterness in the human, in the Christian heart. What does he say? First Corinthians three verse three. While there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh, and behaving only in a human way? See, strife belongs to the flesh. It is a work of the flesh. Galatians five, not a work of the spirit. And finally, we need to be aware that purity is crucial if we're to have an impact in being peacemakers and reaching others for God. Now we said before that the order of the Beatitudes is important. They have been described as rungs in the ladder. Each one progresses and builds on the previous one. And what was the previous one to this? Blessed are the pure in heart. And to see the sequence of moving from pure in heart to being a peacemaker is natural because one of the most common con causes of conflict among people is lack of purity, is deceit and hypocrisy in our hearts. So acknowledge the barriers to peacemaking, the first step. But then also appreciate that uh, this is something that is unnatural to us. Some people are naturally more argumentative than others. However, when Jesus lists these characteristics, these traits of the kingdom here in the Beatitudes, we're confronted with traits that are not ours naturally. 
Men and women are not naturally poor in spirit. They don't grieve over their sin. They don't mourn over it. They don't naturally hunger for righteousness. They're not naturally merciful or pure. And in our own strength, we are not peacemakers. Rather, we are peace breakers. It is only as we walk in the step with the Holy Spirit that we can be ambassadors for reconciliation, as Paul speaks of in 2 Corinthians 5. It is clear from Scripture that being a peacemaker takes effort. That's true at home. It's true in the church. It's true in society. And Paul in Ephesians 4 verse 3 urges the believers in Ephesus to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. In the preceding verse he says this, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. You see, without patience, without gentleness, without love, we will never be a peacemaker. And what are those things? They are listed as the fruit of the Spirit. We need to acknowledge the barriers to peacemaking. We need to appreciate as something that is not natural to us because our natural human tendency is to look after our own interests first, not think of others. But then thirdly, we must affirm that Jesus is the only one who can bring true and lasting deep peace. You see, you and I cannot give someone peace with God, but we can point them to Jesus Christ, who alone brings peace with God. We cannot cause someone to lie down in tranquility. We cannot have them believe we will take care of their problems, but we can point them to the Father the one who loves them and cares for them, the one who can give them true peace. Remember what Jesus said when he was speaking to the disciples, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Jesus can give us a true peace that this world can never give, a peace that is beyond all understanding. As peacemakers, we acknowledge that sometimes we can be a barrier to peacemaking because of sin in our hearts. We must appreciate it doesn't come naturally to us. We must walk in step with the Spirit. And we must affirm that Jesus Christ is a true giver of real, lasting peace. We have considered the meaning of being a peacemaker. And the model, the perfect model of Jesus. And the method of being a peacemaker. But this beatitude finally reminds us of the merit of the peacemaker. What does it say? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And I appreciate that in some versions it does say children, but we'll look at that in a moment. And this is what Ken Hughes says about this. He says, this is a sublime benefit that stresses once again the meaning is emphatic. The Greek order is this, for they sons of God shall be called. For they sons of God shall be called. The idea is that they and no other will be called God's son. And Kent Hughes continues, Moreover, the passive voice indicates that it is God, not man, who assigns him this title, sons. The word call means to officially designate, as in designate, a spokesperson or choose a captain. And Jesus says that those who are peacemakers will be known or recognized or designated for what they really are, sons of God. Now, as I said in the beginning, some versions have sons of God. Others conclude that this beatitude, they shall be called children of God. But scholars point out the two terms are not quite identical. A child of God is one who is part of a family. It's a statement of position. We are adopted into God's family by faith. That's our position. But a son of God is something a little stronger. It's one who is like the family. It's a statement of character. The Son of God is one who not only carries on the family name, but bears the family resemblance and reputation. And Jesus is saying that as his followers become known as peacemakers, they will be recognized as sons of God who share the name and the mission of Christ. So being called the Son of God in this context means that we're acting like God. And of course, there's no higher aim for the Christian than striving to act like God. Later in the Sermon on the Mount, we will read these words, Matthew 5, 48. 
You must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And that's speaking about being mature. And we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that Jesus calls us to, to be like our Heavenly Father, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God and Christ forgive you, Ephesians 4, 25. So we should bear the resemblance of Christ, bear the resemblance of God in being peacemakers. There's an interesting story told of a president of America, Calvin Coolidge. He invited some people from his hometown to the White House for dinner. They didn't know how to behave in the White House. They'd never been in an occasion like this before. So they considered together the best policy is simply to follow what the president does. That seemed good, but the time came for serving coffee. And the president poured his coffee into a saucer. Of course, as soon as the folks from his hometown saw this, they did the same. The next step was for the president to pour some milk and add a little sugar to the coffee in the saucer. And they did the same. They thought for sure the next step would be the president would take the, the saucer with the coffee and he'd begin to sip it. But that's not what he did. He leaned over, placed the saucer on the floor and called the White House cat to come over. They misunderstood, but their motives were good. Their desire was to copy the president. And we are to observe God. We are to understand what God desires as we study his word. And our desire should be to follow his example and to be a peacemaker. And when you're truly working for real peace, Jesus is saying you bear God's likeness. But as I close, let's remember that as Jesus shared these words, they were radical to the first hearer. You see, the Jews in that day were expecting liberation from a Messiah by military force. So here is Jesus saying, blessed are the peacemakers. The peacemakers are those who are approved by God. But what about us today in 2020? What are the challenges from this beatitude? Let me leave you three simple thoughts. First of all, the question to each one of us, do we know peace with God? The one who does not belong to God through trusting in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross can neither have this peace or be a peacemaker. God can only work peace through us after he has worked peace in us. Peacemaking begins with an experience of peace in our own hearts. Do you know peace with God through trusting in Christ? But if you do, then the second question is, do we make it our goal to live in harmony with others? Paul said, as far as it is possible, seek to live in peace with all. It might not be possible, but Christians have an obligation to seek to live in peace. And for Christians today, it's a real challenge to our attitudes and to our priorities. When you make peace, you become like the God of peace. Peacemakers have a family resemblance that even people of the world can see. We're not to seek peace at any cost, we're not to compromise, but we're to seek as far as possible to live at peace with all. And finally, do we desire others to know and experience peace with God? You see, we're called to go into the world as peacemakers and the greatest need is to reconcile men and women to God. That is the heart of the gospel. One writer shares this observation. Into this ugly world filled with violence and hate, Jesus sends us to be peacemakers. We aren't given the choice of whether or not we would like to be peacemakers, and we certainly aren't given the choice of what kind of world we would like to live in. As bad as things may be, this is the only world we have. And if we're going to be true to our Lord, we must be peacemakers. Just as Jesus, the greatest peacemaker, was misunderstood and misrepresented, we too may not be appreciated. We may be misunderstood and misrepresented in what we seek to do. Yet we must strive to direct lost people to God that they might know and experience real peace with God. We must, as far as possible, live in harmony with everyone. And we must remember that every believer should be a peacemaker in the sense of spreading the good news that peace with God 
is possible. The peace with God is available. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Amen. What a close in prayer, and we do uh, remember the needs of our congregations, those who are unwell. Uh, we remember particularly our government, locally and nationally, at this time when there's real problems continuing with coronavirus, and when we read about millions more being placed in lockdown. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the fact that Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross for us, that we might know peace with you. He who had no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. We thank you that Jesus has reconciled us to you because he has suffered your wrath against sin. Lord, we thank you that you accepted his sacrifice. We thank you for that once for all sacrifice for our sin. We pray, Lord, that you would help us indeed to understand and appreciate the peace that Jesus has purchased through his shed blood. Help us also to seek to live in harmony and peace with all, not to be marked by bitterness or strife, but, Lord, to be conscious that we should live peaceably with all. We also pray that it will be our desire that others will come to experience your peace in their hearts and lives. Help us to point people to Jesus, the only Saviour of the world, the one who is able to bring joy and satisfaction, the one who is able to bring peace with you, O Holy God. We pray at this time for our congregations. We lift up before you those ill at home or in hospital and pray that they would know your healing and your strengthening touch. We are conscious too at this time of the continued threat of coronavirus and so we ask again for wisdom for leaders politically in Stormont and in Westminster. We pray for those in the cabinet and for the Prime Minister as they make crucial decisions that they would seek your will and that you would guide and direct. We pray for many countries in the world where uh, millions have been placed again into lockdown, where this coronavirus has uh, re-emerged and is continuing to cause real anxiety and real fear. We pray that you would give wisdom to the leaders and we pray indeed that the spread would halt. We pray at this time for our missionaries and we know that some of our missionaries are still abroad living in difficult circumstances, some separated from loved ones at home. We pray that you would sustain and strengthen each one of them. We thank you for some churches that have returned to worshipping in their church buildings and we pray that you will continue to bless them and guide them. We pray for the congregations here in Apidui and in Crossgar as the sessions meet, as they deliberate. And we pray, Lord, that you would give wisdom in seeking to decide the date of return. And we pray that you would guide and direct all the steps that are involved. We do pray that we will continue to know your blessing, whether we meet in a church building or worship online. We thank you indeed for all that has been done and for those who have used their skills for this. When we indeed rejoice that your word is still being proclaimed and we just pray that we will continue uh, to learn from your word and continue to understand its benefits to us. Guide and direct us each day, we pray. We just commit ourselves our loved ones, our family members, and indeed our troubled world to you. And pray, Lord, that each one will know Jesus, the true Prince of Peace, and walk with him each day. These things we pray in our Saviour's precious name. Amen.